my name is Dr. John Brocious. I'm a board certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon who focuses on gender surgery and this is a day in my life. So my typical day starts at six in the morning. Uh, I go to the gym, lift weights, I'll run five miles and then, uh, then we're gonna head to the clinic and we'll see a few consultations, hopefully some exciting ones and some post-op patients. Uh, then this afternoon we have a couple surgery, outpatient surgeries at the surgery center and then anybody who knows me well knows that uh, there's a good chance that the day in my life will end at the tattoo studio. All right, so we're off to clinic now to see some patients. Um, so my specialty is actually gender surgery. And so people ask me all the time, like, you know, what is gender surgery? Um, and so as a specialty, it really encompasses, you know, even more than just plastic surgery. Um, it can be head to toe operations. Uh, for example, facial feminization, tracheal shave, you know, which is the Adam's apple surgery. Uh, my focus though is on chest surgery um, for transgender patients, uh, as well as uh, the genital surgeries. So the chest surgery would be like breast augmentation for the transgender women um, and uh, mastectomies for the transgender men. Um, and then the genital surgeries, I'm actually the only surgeon in the state of Nevada that offers any genital surgeries for the transgender populations. Um, and uh, one of the few really actually in the country and uh, the operations that I perform are um, called vaginoplasty. And so that's essentially the creation of a fully functional uh, vagina and vulva uh, from the male anatomy. And so these patients are able to have sex, they're able to have orgasms potentially. Um, the reconstructions are very aesthetic and, uh, and look very natural. Um, and so that's one of my favorite operations and, uh, and so that's, that's what gender surgery actually is. So we'll see some uh, before and after patients today, uh, hopefully have some vaginoplasties as well as some chest surgeries. What's going on, my man? How you been? Long time no see. So DJ, tell me, how do you feel physically and psychologically after having the surgery? Uh, well, physically I'm feeling 100% better. You know, I'm, I've gotten all my strength back. I've gotten every, you know, everything's good to go. Uh, psychologically, I definitely feel a lot better that, you know, I'm not worried about where am I going? Can I take off my shirt? Can I not? just giving people hugs and embracing them without having some kind of a binder on or living in Las Vegas and not wearing a binder in 115 degree weather. Uh, I feel like it's something that people take for granted, just being able to take off their shirt and just being able to, to sunbathe and do all that stuff. Um, for me, it's a tremendous weight lifted off my shoulders that I don't have to go through all of this psychologically constantly. It's like once that stuff was taken by you off the medical table, it was taken off my chest, like literally, so. That's awesome. And that's what inspires me to continue doing these surgeries. My experience working with Dr. Brogius was just, it's been amazing. It's really important that in our community, when you're going to see a doctor, that you're actually there talking to an actual person. How many times do you see a tattoo doctor anywhere? You don't. The thing is being down to earth, being grounded, a lot of these people are, or a lot of these people are just kind of lost and they need somebody to kind of to grasp onto that's going to listen to them that's going to pay attention to them so my experience with dr bro is just like with everybody else i feel like it's a real down-to-earth kind of thing and it's something that we hang on to because you can come into the doctor's office and say hey this guy kind of looks like me or like somebody that i know i feel comfortable talking to
So we saw a variety of patients in clinic. Some uh, were preoperative patients, some were postoperative patients. Pre we had a few preoperative uh, transgender men seeking uh, chest masculinization surgery, which is essentially a double mastectomy. Uh, we also saw some transgender women interested in breast augmentation, um, as well as in vaginoplasty. Um, we saw some post-op patients as well, post-op chest surgeries, um, as well as some post-op vaginoplasty patients. Um, I do have to spend a lot of time with the vaginoplasty patients postoperatively. Um, they do require a lot of care. Uh, if you think about it, the body it was just, you know, I just created a new hole within this body and the body wants to kind of scar that down. So the patients um, require a lot of work to keep that, uh, to keep their vagina open. And uh, so I spent a lot of time talking to them how to care for their new body part and kind of things what to expect in the future as, as it heals. Um, and, uh, and it's also a very gratifying thing because this is essentially giving a patient a body part that they've always wanted that they never had before. All right, this is Dr. Joshua Goldman. Um, he's actually the, my partner here at the Vegas Plastic Surgery Institute and the other surgeon in the practice. Um, we're both board certified reconstructive and plastic surgeons that do cosmetic and reconstructive surgery head to toe. He does have a skill set that kind of rounds out the gender surgery program that I'm, that I'm starting here, uh, specifically facial feminization. Yeah, so with a background in uh, cranial facial surgery, I'm able to offer those services to our gender patients. And it's really nice because when we're both in the clinic, we're able to see those patients together and offer those services at the same time. So Dr. Brochus will often see his patients and then I'll come in and consult on those other available services. And it's pretty unusual to have two reconstructive plastic surgeons to go out and to practice together. But we do a lot of big surgeries, a lot of microsurgery, and oftentimes it's two surgeons working simultaneously on two different body parts. And so it's good to have someone that you know for a long time and trust uh, who's got your back. Um, we take call at the uh, level one trauma center and the level two trauma center here in, in Las Vegas. Um, so we're often called upon to do facial injuries. And so it's very common to have facial fractures, fractures of the facial bone. Um, this is a patient that we just recently were consulted on um, who has a fracture of his eye socket. So in this CT scan, you're looking directly at the patient's face. And so you can see this is the eyes right here. And if you look at this eye socket compared to this eye socket, the fractures of the orbital floor and medial orbital wall have been displaced. So it's not uncommon for plastic surgeons to have to go in there and reconstruct that with basically plates and screws and titanium mesh to rebuild the eye socket so that the eye has a place to rest. So this is another view of the same CAT scan of that last patient. Um, however, in this view, it's a little bit different. The patient is lying on his back. This is the back of the patient's head and this is the eyeballs. And so you can see on the patient's left eye here, there's some black spots. That's actually subcutaneous air. So when the patient fractured their orbital wall right here, there's basically a connection between the air, which is the sinus, and the eye. And so that's what you're seeing there. And the area that we are often called to reconstruct is this wall right here. You can see on the normal eye, there's a nice clean white line there. We're probably going to have to reconstruct this wall with titanium mesh in order to kind of recreate the eye socket. All right, so clinic was good. Uh, we saw some pre-op patients, saw some post-op patients. Uh, now it's time to head to the surgery center and do some surgery. So we're here at the surgery center for a couple quick cases and uh, should be a good day. So this first surgery that we're doing today is uh, breast augmentation on a young transgender woman. Um, it's pretty similar to breast augmentation on a cisgender female. Um, there are some subtle differences though. For example, the trans women typically have very little breast tissue, so you need a bigger implant. Uh, but on the same side, they have less soft tissue that can stretch out to accommodate that implant. So it's a little bit tricky. Um, also, the, uh, the technique has to be spot on because they don't have a whole lot of breast tissue to camouflage in the implant malposition. Um, and then, of course, the nipples are typically located more widely spaced than in a cisgender female. So um, that makes it a little bit more tricky. So uh, that will be our first case and that uh, should be a good one. So this uh, second case is actually a revision breast augmentation on a uh, patient who's intersex. Um, and as you may know, intersex is a condition where you have uh, any degree of both the male and female uh, genitalia and or gonads. So, you know, gender surgery is typically for transgender patients, but it's also for non-binary patients, gender fluid patients, and patients like today who are intersex. day in the life of John Brocious often ends at a tattoo studio. So we're on our way to Hive Studios here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and one of my best friends, Swarm, is gonna be doing a fresh tattoo on me. A few years ago, I decided I was gonna start tattooing some of my more visible body parts. And so you can imagine as a doctor, uh, my friends and family are like, what are you doing? You're a surgeon, you can't be tattooing your throat and your hands. This is gonna derail your career completely. And I said, look, you know, this was right around the same time that I started doing you know, mostly transgender surgery. I said, the transgender population has been judged on their appearance their entire lives. 
there's no way they're gonna come into my office, look at me with my tattoos and judge me on my appearance. So it's like a judgment-free zone in my clinic, right? I don't judge you, you don't judge me. Um, we are who we are, we're authentic people. Um, and in a way, I would say that the majority of my patients think that it's a good thing. They're more willing to open up to me. They think I'm down to earth. Um, uh, I can't say that my colleagues are necessarily feel the same way about my patients, but I will have to say, in all of my years as being uh, a surgeon, I have not had a single patient say a negative thing about my tattoos. So that's the end of my day. Uh, it's about 7.30. Um, we got home just in time to catch this beautiful Las Vegas sunset. My typical day will usually end around 7, 7.30. Um, sometimes I have a longer case or a, a longer day, um, but typically around this time I'm home. Um, just because I'm home doesn't mean I'm done working. Oftentimes I have to do my charting, uh, prepare for upcoming surgeries, look at uh, office billing, that kind of a thing. Um, so the life of a surgeon doesn't always, you know, end when they get home, uh, but sometimes it does. People always ask me, um, you know, why did you become a plastic surgeon? Uh, and specifically, why did you become a gender surgeon? So when I was in medical school, I, really, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon, right? I knew I wanted to work with my hands and I wanted to accomplish something that I could see, you know, at the end of the day. And the reason I like plastic surgery is because, you know, plastic surgeons are the true general surgeons. We operate head to toe, every tissue, every type of anatomy. And um, a lot of people find that daunting and don't want to go into plastic surgery, but I, you know, anatomy was my favorite subject. So I, you know, was drawn naturally towards plastic surgery. The way I got into gender surgery, it wasn't that I had, you know, a transgender brother or some experience with a transgender person. It was actually just kind of happened to me. Um, I went out into practice during the tail end of the recession. And uh, when you go out into practice during a recession, you got to do anything you can to eat. So I ended up getting this reputation that I'd be willing to do anything as long as it was remotely related to plastic surgery. So I started, started getting transgender patients calling my office asking me to do gender surgery. I told them I didn't ever train in it, but I, I think I could figure it out. And I'll never forget my first consultation with a transgender woman who came in wanting a breast augmentation. At the end of the consultation, she started crying. And I thought for sure I'd misgendered her or you know, used the wrong pronoun, wrong name. And then she told me, no, these are tears of joy that, that no other physician has treated her like a human being all of the city of Pittsburgh. And that's when a light bulb went off in my head. You know, I did her surgery, went off without a hitch, and uh, she was the happiest patient. And so I kind of had this idea that, you know, as one surgeon, one person, I could make a huge impact on a community that's been marginalized by the healthcare system. And that's what drove me to gender surgery. So people often ask me if I am willing to do gender surgery on minors. Um, and the short answer is yes. Uh, I know there's a lot of surgeons out there that say I have an age 18 cutoff for any gender surgery, but in my opinion, that's really to protect the surgeon, not the patient. And um, if you think about you know, the suicide rates of the transgender population, 40% of transgender people will attempt or commit suicide in their lives. So your classic example is going to be of a, a young, you know, late teenage boy, transgender boy, so assigned female at birth, has taken hormones, now has developed a very masculine body in terms of you know, muscle, beard, a deep voice, and this, this particular patients wanna play sports and be in the locker room with their friends, um, except they have breast tissue. And so I'm not gonna force this child to live through high school in the locker room with their buddies with breast tissue and be self-conscious and potentially suicidal in order to protect my license. Now, a lot of surgeons will say, I'll just wait till age 18, but you know what? A lot of these patients may not make it to age 18. Um, the suicide rate is just too high for me to just have an arbitrary cutoff rate of age 18. So as long as it's the right patient, the right family support, the mental health clearance is there, I have no problem operating on minors um, in order to save their lives. And one thing that I didn't fully understand when I was applying to medical school is the length of education that's required to be something like a plastic surgeon. I mean, if you think about it, I had 14 years of school after high school. So that's four years of medical school. Then that was right after four years of college, plus a minimum of six years of residency. It puts you at 14 years. And there was not a physician in my entire extended family, so nobody really gave me any guidance about that. So I was a little shocked when I realized how long it was going to be um, for me to become a plastic surgeon. You know, I grew up in a time where we didn't have something like med school insiders, which would give you kind of like a play-by-play -play of what it takes to be a plastic surgeon or to be a neurosurgeon, whatever type of doctor you want to be. Um, I think having a resource like that would be really helpful um, for a young version of me. Um, I don't think I would have changed anything in terms of my, my pathway had I known what, uh, what was coming, uh, but it would be nice to know what to expect. And I think uh, a resource like Med School Insiders would give you that. So another thing you have to think about when you're choosing your specialty is you know, the work-life balance. I love what I do, I love my job, uh, I have no complaints, but my job consumes my whole life. Um, like I told you earlier, I'm the only surgeon in the state of Nevada that does the genital surgeries for transgender patients. So I have to basically be available for my patients for a complication or anything that may arise 24-7, um, 365. So I leave town very little. Um, I have to always be available in case of an emergency for one of my patients because I don't have anyone that can really cover, you know, 
the patient, the, the surgeries that I do. Um, so it's very difficult to, to kind of have a social life. Um, I don't have a family, so that makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, and certainly I wouldn't, I wouldn't change the way I've done things, but if, uh, if you're really concerned about work-life balance, um, there are fields within healthcare that you can have a great work-life balance and there are fields that, that you don't. So you really have to kind of focus and, and think about your priorities before you choose your field. If you want to become a doctor or a surgeon and need help as a pre-med or med student, please check out medschoolinsiders.com.